If you have your Bibles with you this morning, I'm going to ask you to turn to two pages or two passages. We're, we're going to flip back and forth, so you'll have to keep your fingers marked in them. One of them is going to be Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. The other one's going to be Matthew chapter 1. So we're going to go to Luke chapter 1. We have some verses there and Matthew chapter 1. So, so go ahead and find both of those. And we, last week we started a, a series uh, of sermons or, or messages that I called Christmas Changes Everything. And we know that. We, we know that, that because of Christmas, because of the birth of Christ, that everything is changed. But unfortunately, even though we know that, a lot of times we have trouble applying that to our lives. So as we look today at Christmas change and everything, I want us to see how Christmas changes our despair to joy. Maybe today for you, this Christmas season is not very joyous. Maybe there's things going on or there's situations or, or maybe you're just like your pastor and you're just turning into Scrooge. And, and, and for you, you're thinking Christmas is just not very joyous. But I want you to know something. As long as there's breath in our body, there are going to be those times of despair. We're all going to have problems. Maybe right now you're struggling with that problem. Maybe it's something that's been recent in your past, or maybe you just feel it's coming in your future. We all have times of despair. But we want the joy. So I want you to think this morning, what are some of those things that, that, about Christmas that makes you happy? You, you can give me your answer. What's something about Christmas that makes you happy? Food. 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 And by the way, as soon as we, I know this is going to make you hungry, but as soon as we finish, we're having a fellowship meal downstairs. So, so, so food, Christmas food, and, and, and do you like the sweets or just like everything? We like everything, don't we? Okay, what else about Christmas that makes us happy? Okay, giving and gifts. Uh, so, you know, we, we hear that a lot of times. You know, the, the getting of the gifts or, or, or the giving of gifts makes us happy. What else? Do what? The most lighted up house. Levi likes to see the lights. And uh, he, he thinks that. Somebody else said something. Family. Family makes us happy. Music. Uh, Pumpkin pie makes us happy. No school makes us happy. So there's all kinds of things about Christmas that makes us happy. But what happens on December 26th? You know, sometimes some of the, the, the leftovers, you still have no school for a few days. But, 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 you know, sometimes some of the leftovers of the, the meals continue on for a, a day or two. You know, sometimes the gifts, you can continue with those. for, But, but it kind of starts waning away, don't it? And then we know that sometime in our life, again, there's going to be the despair. So how, do we, how does Christmas change our despair to joy? This morning, we're going to look at, at, at four characters from the Christmas story, very familiar characters to you, two couples. And we're going to look at their lives of despair and the Christmas joy. So to do that, we're going to have to look at two passages. So I'm going to ask you, if you would, to stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. We're going to start in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. We're going to start in chapter 1 with verse 5. Luke chapter 1, verse 5. Here's what it says. There were in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah. And his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. And they had no child, because that Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in years. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. 
And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. Now if you would flip back to Matthew chapter 1. We're only going to look at a couple verses here. Matthew 1 verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you for teaching us how our despair can be turned to joy. Guide us in it today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. As we look at these four, four people, four characters of the Christmas story, two couples here, Zachariah and Elizabeth and, and Mary and Joseph, I want us to first to look at their Christmas despair. So as we look at it, I want us to see that, that in their lives, you know, we look at these and they were Bible characters and we think, oh, because they were Bible characters, everything just must have been great. You know, because they were a part of the Christmas story and the coming of Jesus, everything just must have been perfect in their life. But I want you to see that, that in their lives, there was despair as well. So as we look at them first, let's look at Zachariah and Elizabeth. And as we look at them, well, we'll start with Zachariah. Who was Zachariah? He was a priest. It says here he was of the order of Abiah. And, and, and what that means was, uh, well, and, and on this day, uh, he was, he was burnt, lighting the incense to offer the prayers for the people before God. Now, what that means as a priest, it, it was his day. See, what happened was over the course of time, there got to be a lot of priests. Now, if you go back to the beginning of the priesthood, it started with Aaron and his sons. And, you know, and we really don't know exactly how many sons Aaron had, but it started with them. So, so for today's message, we're going to say Aaron had five sons. You know, so he, the priesthood goes to them, and the five sons, well, if each son had two sons each, now they just went from five to ten. And let's imagine that each of those sons ha- had two sons each, so now we went to, from, from ten to twenty. And you see that number just kept growing. By the time it gets to Zechariah's day, there's this huge amount of Levites, and all the Levite males were priests. So it got to the point where there was just too many people in the temple. There was no way for them all to do the service at the same time. So back when David was king, David had an idea. He said, let's divide up the priest into orders. So they set aside 24 orders of the priesthood. It says here that that he was of the order of Abiah. So so that was his group of priests, you know, following after his particular line of the the family of Aaron. So, So now it was his time. It was his day. So only once every 24 days would he even go to serve at the temple. But it says it was was his time. He was drawn to be the one to to light the incense. So out of all the priests of the order of Abiah, you know, they would kind of divide up, okay, you're going to take this day, and then 24 24 days later you're going to take this day, and 24 days later you're going to take this day. So they divided up the priesthood of that order, as to the one day that you would go and and light the incense and and, and to offer the prayers for the people. So for Zechariah, this was his special day. This probably was the only day of his life that he would ever have this special time where he got to be the priest to light the incense. He was the one in charge. Uh, of doing that, to, to, uh, of lifting the prayers of the people. It says all the people were outside praying. So, so for Zechariah, it was his one special day. He was going to go in and light the incense. And he had a particular prayer request as well. Because it says he'd been praying. So, so when we look at Zechariah, we see that he was a priest. His wife Elizabeth, she was a Levite as well. It says here she, she was of the daughters of Aaron. 
So, so you know, he, here she is, you know, of the, of the religious family, you know, the family of the priests. You know, so she wasn't a priest, obviously. She was a female. But, but here she was, you know, she was part of that family as well. But when we look at the two of them together, you know, we see some things about their life. The first thing I need you to see is they were godly people. Both of them were, were godly people. It says here that they were righteous before the eyes of the Lord. They kept his commands and his statutes. So it wasn't just, you know, when we think of Zachariah and Elizabeth, for us to understand the things about them, we, we need to know they were more than just the go to the temple once every 24 days type of people. Now, now we know sometimes in our lives it falls that, you know, the only time we think about the Lord is on Sunday. You know, and, or, or the only time we, we even concentrate on anything about God is just when we, we have nothing else to do. So, honey, you want to go to church today? You know, these were not the people who just showed up occasionally. They loved God every day of their life. They lived righteous before him. They kept the commands and the statutes of the law of God. And it says, and they kept them blamelessly. So these folks did everything they could to live for God. Now, you'd think that for this godly couple, everything would be fine, wouldn't you? But they had a couple problems. First problem, they had no child. For them, there was no son. There was no child. It says Elizabeth was barren. She couldn't have children. So when we look at them, and we have to understand in that day and culture, that was a whole lot different than today. Today in our culture, you know, someone doesn't have children. It's, well, okay, not a big deal. We don't think any higher or any lower of them because of that. <coughs> but in Zechariah and Elizabeth's day, it was frowned upon if you didn't have children. For, for a couple of reasons. One, it was important to them to have someone to carry on the family name. So, so they would need a son so that when they were dead and gone, that there would be someone to carry on the family name. Another reason was folks would look at, at, at a, a person with no children because they thought children were a blessing from God, and we know they are. But they would say, well, this person has no children, so they've not been blessed, but God wonder what they did wrong. Wonder what's going on in their life. Here's Zechariah, the priest, and his, he and his wife have no children. He must be messed up somewhere. So they would look at that, and so, so society would look down upon that. And then keep in mind, Zechariah was a priest, and it was very important in the priesthood you know, where did the next generations of priests come from? The children of the priest. So without a child, his particular line of priesthood was going to stop with him. Oh, yeah, there's, there's the, the others uh, you know, around, but, but his particular family of priests, it was going to stop with him. So in that day and time, for them to not be, or to be without a child, oh, it, it was a disgrace. Folks probably talked about them behind their back or maybe even to their face. It was a, a total disgrace to society. But you know, to make it even worse, there was another problem. They were old. Now, I, I love the way it says it in the King James. It says they were well stricken in years. Now, I've tried to decide, does that make it sound better or worse? So would it be better for me when my, you know, my children have this habit of telling me I'm old? You know, would it be better for them to say, Dad, you're old? Or, Dad, you have become well stricken in years. I don't know which one's worse, but I, I kind of like it. It says they were well stricken in years. But here's what that means. They didn't even get asked anymore. They got the senior discount everywhere. You know, and it's not that, that you know, here, I, a lot of times we think, okay, because we know the rest of the story. You know, they're going to have a baby. And, but but we, we look at it and we say, okay, you know, they're old, but they're kind of like that age, like most folks aren't having babies by this time, but it could be possible. Huh. It says they were well stricken in years. What I think? I think they're really old. They're past the point to where, where you know, everybody's going to go, huh. There's no chance for them now. You know, we've been holding out hope, but there's no, they're just past that age. 
So here they are. They have no child, and they're too old to have any. Even if something were to happen, Elizabeth could. The age is done, took over. So as we look at this couple, we know that in their life, there was despair. So when we look at them, this was their, we'll call it Christmas, despair. But now I told you we're going to look at two couples. So not only Zachariah and Elizabeth and their despair, but let's jump to the other couple. One we're probably even more familiar with. Let's look at Joseph and Mary. And just looking at their life a little bit, there's a little bit that we know about Joseph. There's some that we can glean from the reading of Scripture. We know he was a carpenter from Galilee. We know he was of the line of David. We know of Mary, Mary here is his bride-to-be, his espoused wife. Um, we know as we look, we find out he was actually a very good man. But, you know, when we look at their lives, were, did they have it all together? No, the first thing I need you to see, I need you to see that they were espoused to be married. They, 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 were, they were ready to be married or, or they were set. Now, to understand that, we have to look at the marriage in their time. I mean, because today, marriage is just almost all messed up as compared to what it was in the Bible. Because the things, if the things that happened in their day were to happen today, there'd either be marriages lasting a whole lot longer or a whole lot less marriages. And here's why. Number one, the marriages in their day were arranged. You know, normally, there, there might be a few cases, but normally, young ladies, you would have no say in the matter. When your man comes along, probably 30 years older or older, and there you are, that, that ready-to-be-wed bride at 13, 14, maybe 15. That was common for the day. And, and your daddy made the arrangements. So, young lady, I want you to think about this for a moment. Who would your daddy pick for you? <laughs> wow. You want to talk of a look that we're just all ready to leave church right now. But, but the marriages were arranged. Now, what it was, it was more, not just an arrangement. It wasn't just like we, we see in a lot of Middle, Middle Eastern countries, you know, where it's like, okay, you know, from birth, we know this man and this girl is going to get married, and no matter what, that's going to be their spouse. They would actually go, the groom, and, and usually his father would go, and they would sit down with the family of the bride-to-be. And they would actually work out a contract. You know, and, and can you imagine this? It's like, you know, sir, I'd like to marry your daughter. And the man says, okay, how many donkeys is she worth? Now, we're going to think that she's like a high price, so we're going to make her worth donkeys. And, and oh, sir, your daughter ain't as fine as you think she is. How about if we talk pigeons? You know, and, and they're going to work out a price, and then they're going to work out arrangements. And always one of those arrangements was, when we get married, she's going to be a virgin. But they're going to work out a contract, not just with, with like a groom and a, uh, the bride's father, but with the whole family. And they're going to work this out. And then what the groom did, he would then go to prepare the place for his bride. After the contract's all worked out and he knows that this beautiful young lady is going to be his bride, legally, for all intents and purposes, from that point on, they're officially married. But he's going to leave. He's going to go back to prepare a place for her. Now, to do that, he's going to make a home for her. Now, if they were really rich, he probably would build a home of their own somewhere if they had that much property and, and he could build a home of his own. But, but, but normally, to make your lives even better as you 13, 14 young girls that your daddy's just picking out your husband, you're going to put your house right up alongside your father-in-law's. Because normally, <laughs> my wife's even saying no now. Normally, that's what they do. The, the groom would just build on to the father-in-law's house, or to, to his dad's house, and make a place. Now, I said that if we follow the customers today, because uh, most of you ladies go, mm-mm. Some of you guys go, mm-mm. Some of you are just thinking, I don't even want to build a house. But to make it worse, during that time, that groom also had to save up equivalent to about a year's wages. Because there are good parts to the system. The honeymoon would last a year. 
After they got married and they had the wedding party, and that's going to be expensive too. After all that, the honey, they're, they're going to honeymoon for a year just so they get to know. He don't work. So he's not only got to build a place for her, he's got to get everything ready. Some of you ladies are going, I'll never get married. I haven't met a man that can save money yet. But when we think of it, that's what it meant. Here they were espoused. That's the place they were. The contract was done. You know, Joseph's getting the place ready, saving the money, getting ready for them to, to be married. The second problem, Mary got pregnant. So when we look at it, it not only, you know, they're here, they're espoused to be married, but, but then Mary was pregnant. Now, we know the story. You know, so here in the year 2016, as, as Bible-reading, Bible-believing, God-fearing people, we know that, you know, that the, the, she was pregnant of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit come on. But put yourself in their spot. All of a sudden, here's this young girl, and we're going to give her the benefit of the doubt. We're going to say she's 15 or 16 by this time. Because she had been married really young. And, and, and she's a spouse. And all of a sudden, angel Lord comes and says, you're going to be with child. It's going to be the Holy Spirit's child. You're going to carry God's son. You're, you're going to be the, 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 the carrier of the Messiah. Now, every Jewish girl would have dreamed of that. But then all of a sudden, reality kicked in. Who's going to tell Joseph? How am I going to tell Joseph? What's Joseph going to do? And then put yourself in Joseph's spot on the other side. All of a sudden, you're bride to be. You done got the contract. Part of the contract's going to say that when you get married, she's a virgin. And all of a sudden, she comes and says, Joseph, honey, we need to have a little talk. You know, every married couple knows that any conversation that starts with that usually isn't good. Um, while you were away building the house, you're going to think this is funny, honey. But, well, let me just cut. I'm pregnant. Now, you know, Joseph's not that dumb of a man. He, he only knows there's one way to get pregnant. And he also knows it wasn't him. But you want to see a little of the character of Joseph? That's what your scripture says. It says, Joseph, being a just man, was willing to put her away privately. So the third thing we see is, is Joseph was willing to, or, or wanted to put her away, was going to put her away privately. Now, I've heard a lot of opinions over what that means. Because you see, that would have just been an absolute no in that society. For them to get married and her already <laughs> to be with child, or even just to know that she been with a man. But we know the story, how the angel come and appeared to Joseph, said, don't be afraid to take her for your wife. The child she's carrying is the Holy Spirit. But I want you to know what Joseph did. A lot of folks say, you know, he put her away privately. He, he just thought about going, no, honey, we're not getting married. You just stay at your father's house. Well, if that was the case, everybody would have known then. Everybody would have known about the, here's what Joseph probably did. He probably decided, just so that it wouldn't hurt her, he was going to go ahead and go through the motions. He was going to finish building the place. He was going to save up the money. He was going to go and bring her to his house just as if they were to be married. But he just wouldn't have consummated the marriage. He was willing to do that. That shows a little bit of his character. But all of a sudden, look at their lives. Here's Joseph and Mary engaged to be married. She's pregnant. Wasn't by him. But it was God's job. Talk about stress. Talk about strife. Talk about despair. When we look at their lives, here's Joseph and Mary, and this was their Christmas despair. Maybe this morning, as you think of your life, you think, my life may not quite be as messed up as theirs. Or maybe right now you're thinking it's even worse. Maybe right now you're going through your own problem. It might be a personal problem. It might be a family issue. It might be spiritual. But right now you're struggling. You're thinking, I can feel, I can understand how these people could feel. 
And it's Christmas. So I want us to look at the second thing this morning. I want us to look not at Christmas despair, but I want us to look to Christmas joy. We're still we're we're in the book of Luke now, and thinking about Zachariah and Elizabeth, and 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 I want you to see some things. Number one, I want you to know that God hears your prayers. First thing you have to know in Christmas joy is God hears your prayers. You want to see something very exciting. Look what happens here to Zechariah. He, he's offering, uh, he's his burning the incense, he's offering his prayers. And verse 13 says, But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. Now my guess is this isn't the first day he's ever prayed for a son. My guess is from the time he got married, maybe even engaged, he was asking God for that boy that son, to carry on the family name, to, to be his part of the line in the priesthood, to, to, to bring honor to their house. He's praying. Says he was a righteous man. Said he was, uh, you know, kept the, the, the ordinances and the laws of God blamelessly. My guess is he's praying. And God wanted him to know he'd heard his prayers. God has heard your prayers. Now, I need you to understand something here. So, so we're, we're, we're going to break off this because i I got to make sure you understand this. God does not promote a name it, claim it type mentality. If you're going through strife, you go, oh, Lord, please take this away. Think about their lives first. Zachariah and Elizabeth. They lived righteously before God. They kept his commands and his ordinances blamelessly. Their first decision was to live for God. So maybe you're thinking, I don't know that God's hearing my prayers. Then I have a question. My first question is, are you living for God? Is your life what he wants it to be right now? Maybe there's sin there that needs to be confessed. Maybe there's something going on that shouldn't be or something that shouldn't be that is. Maybe in your life, it's time for you to get things right with God. Then you can know God's hearing your prayers. The other part of that, are you praying? How's God going to hear your prayers? Oh, he knows my heart, Pastor. Absolutely he does. But God wants us to voice those prayers. Are we calling on him for that despair in our life? How do we turn Christmas despair to Christmas joy? We live for him and we pray. But we need to know that God hears your prayers. The second thing I want you to know is God has a plan for your life. Look back at verse 13 again. The second part of that verse it says, Your wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord. Look at that. He, here's this old man married to an old woman who's barren. And now God says, I've heard your prayers, and you're going to have a son. And that son, you're going to call him John, and he's going to bring joy to your life. Folks, I want you to know something today. Christmas can be a rough time. Christmas can be a terrible time. Christmas can be the most depressing time. But I want you to hear this. God has a plan for you. He has a plan for your life. Just like he did Zacharias. Now that plan is going to bring God glory. But he has a plan for you. So God hears your prayers. God has a plan for your life. But we also need to know that God can do amazing things in you. Now, I'm not going to leave here. don't want you to leave here this morning thinking that every elderly lady in this place is going to end up pregnant. <laughs> that could be kind of funny. But here's what I want you to know. When we let God control our lives, 
He will do amazing things. Right now, we might be in our pit of despair. But we know that when we live for him and when we call out to him, he will hear our prayers. And we know that he has a plan for our life and what he wants us to do. But we also know that God will do amazing things. An older woman, an older barren woman and an old man, well stricken in years. And God says, your wife's going to have a baby. You're going to call him John. The fourth thing I need you to see, not just God hears your prayers, has a plan for life and can do amazing things, but God will be glorified through you. That John, he's none other than John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus. But I want you to see something else. Flip back again to the book of Matthew. We didn't read this far, but jump down to verse 20. Said, you know, Mary found out Mary is pregnant. Joseph is going to not make a public example, put her away privately. Verse 20 says, But when he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take thee, Mary, thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. You ready for this? And she shall bring forth a son. And now shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Folks, right now in your life, your Christmas may seem more like despair. But I want you to know something. God wants to bring joy to your life. And not just a little bit of joy. He wants to bring joy in such a way that he will be glorified through you. Christmas changes everything. And folks, it can change your despair to joy. Now, I don't know what's going on in your life today. I don't know what's happening at home. I don't know what's happening to you personally. I don't know what spiritual struggles you may be having. I don't know what it is that Christmas has thrown at you. But I do know this. Christmas can change that. Let me be more specific. Jesus can change that. He can change that despair to joy. So what do we need to do? Let's review. Maybe you just need to know that he hears your prayers. He he hears when you pray. Now for that... You've got to be living for him. Maybe this morning, God's already convicted your heart that you're not living for Jesus. Your life isn't what he would have it to be. It's time to change that. Maybe for you, it's to accept his gift of salvation and trust Jesus as your Savior and Lord. Or maybe for you, it's just turning from that sin and following Jesus. Maybe it's a recommitment of your life to follow him. Maybe it's saying, forgive me of my sin and turning from it to follow Jesus. Maybe for you it's the fact that you haven't asked. You just haven't prayed. Maybe this morning you just need to lift to God that concern, that despair that you're facing right now. Maybe for you, you just realize God's got a plan for you. He wants to do something in your life. Let's take a step farther. He wants to do amazing things in your life. Or let's go even farther. He wants to do amazing things that will glorify him through you. Maybe this morning you just need to say, I'm here, God. Use me. Change me. Mold me, shape me, however you want to say it. Maybe you just need to surrender your all to Him. Christmas changes everything. This morning, are you willing to let it change your despair to Jesus' joy? While we sing a final hymn, maybe you want to come to the altar and pray. Maybe you want to pray right where you're at. 
Maybe you want to surrender that to him. I'll invite you to come as we sing. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the wonderful accounts that we have of the Christmas story. Now, Father, I want to pray for every person here. Lord, I believe because you laid this message on my heart that you intended it to speak to the hearts of others. So, Lord, I just pray that they respond. Maybe there's folks here for the first time that needs to accept your gift of salvation. Maybe there's folks here that need to turn from their sin to follow you. Maybe there's folks that aren't living as they should and right now they need to to get that back on the straight and narrow. Maybe there's folks that need to pray. Maybe there's folks that you want to do amazing things through and they just got to let you. Lord, I don't know, but you do. So Lord, I pray that today we just respond to whatever it is you want to do in our life. We'll say yes.